I'm now delighted to welcome Jim Carr as our speaker tonight. Jim has been a, a naturalist since boyhood. After earning a Bachelor of Science in Fish and Wildlife Biology and a PhD in Zoology, he traveled the globe's tropical regions, studying forest birds in Central and South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and New Guinea. As a professor at Purdue University, the University of Illinois, and Virginia Tech, and as deputy director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, Jim took his love of natural history beyond tropical ecology to the ecology of rivers, streams, and other fresh waters. He developed a tool that is now used worldwide for looking at the biology of waters <clears throat> to assess their health. Jim came to the UW in 1991 and was a professor of biology and an adjunct professor of civil and environmental engineering, environmental health, and public affairs. During these years, his teaching and research broadened into environmental policy and the ties binding human with non-human nature. He retired in 2006 as professor emeritus of the UW School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. He has more than 300 published works and has received dozens of prestigious awards and accolades. He continues to be a naturalist and teacher whenever he can. <clears throat> Tonight, we're privileged to have Jim tell us about an ongoing study of neotropical birds in a protected area of Panama, a study he initiated as a graduate student in 1967. He has remained involved in the study and will tell us what he and the subsequent teams conducting this research over the decades have learned and the questions and concerns these trends raise. And I turn the mic over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You may go ahead and share a screen. And as he's finding that, I want to pull folks' attention to the chat box where Karen has said, Hail Purdue. And also, there are about five or six um, links that, if you are able to click on them while we're here in the meeting, that will give you the opportunity to open them up on your browser if you're on a computer. Jim, uh -huh. if, you can, if you close that, um, Particular, that's exactly right. There you go. And no, I've lost my. You have a few other uh, wind. There we go. You're in like Flint. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to take a, a bit of time, a bit of your time tonight to share some of my experiences working in the forest in central Panama. And uh, I'm going to talk only about one of the components of all the work that we've been doing down there. I'll give a list later of some of the other studies that I've been involved with. And then my colleagues that have continued the work down there have done a, a very impressive additional series of things. Today, I'd like to talk about unexpected population trends in Panama rainforest birds. And while doing that, I wanna talk about three tangled webs I often think of physics as a complex subject, but the reality is, in my opinion, that physics is relatively simple by comparison to biology. And the three tangled webs I'm gonna talk about tonight uh, will illustrate some of the complexities. To begin, I'd like to draw attention to a paper that was published in Science in 2019, a study of bird populations in North America that concluded that since 1970, approximately 2.9 million fewer breeding adult birds are in North America than there were uh, now 50 years ago. And that's broad and true across the, the continent. And this slide on the left shows that as a general graph. And then it shows that there's also basically large declines in populations in all, almost all habitats except wetlands across North America. Other studies have been done in North America and in Europe documenting these kinds of population declines broadly across birds of many kinds in many geographic areas. So the question I'd like to sort of pose tonight for the business for uh, as our subject is, how are resident birds doing in tropical places right now? So I'm only talking about 100 hectare plot in the tropics, but it is the largest, longest running database of population monitoring in tropical forest birds. The satellite image shows the Republic of Panama to the right is Colombia, 
and then north and west, Costa Rica and Nicaragua. The black or the yellow box in the middle is the outlining of the canal area, which is where this our studies were done. This is going in a little closer to look at the uh, map of central Panama. The uh, national park, uh, the national park here in yellow or yellowish is called, and it's not a very subtle statement, Parque Nacional Soberanilla. This area was part of the canal zone for many decades when the canal zone was turned over to the appropriately to the Republic of Panama, they named this park Sovereignty National Park. A major research site in Panama is the area here in the Yellow Star, Barrow, Colorado Island. Uh, next year, there will be a, a hundred year celebration of the Smithsonian's work in, in central Panama. And much of that over most of that time is on Barrow, Colorado and in other areas throughout the country. So here again, and the air, same aerial view of the Panama, uh, Colombia to Nicaragua, a close up. And I, we get our first hint of what's going on here. The limbo plot is shown with this white star, Barrow, Colorado Island here. And you see the dark color going all along the edge of the canal where well, this is the canal here on both the western side of the of the canal and the eastern side of the canal because this was in the canal zone in the early days those forests were relatively protected and much of the air surrounding area the forests have not been maintained this is a shot in parque nacional soberanilla I don't know if any of you ever been to Panama in the birding groups there with the canopy tower and, the, and so forth. This is the canopy tower, now a full-time bird watching place for tourist groups going to Panama. And they have two other facilities around the country, but it's just tall trees, very complex uh, uh, undulating uh, canopy. Uh, and here is an example of how high that canopy can be. This is a, pipe, a tree in the edge of my study area there. This is a pipeline road, which I'll refer to probably a number of times. This is a very tall canopy, emergent tree. You get a feel for its height by a six foot tall person standing here marked by the arrow. This is, area was very open in 1969, much of the vegetation has closed in on this road since that time because the people are there's hasn't been really easy access for a very long time. I've been involved with a series of major research topics beginning with a tropical temperate comparison for my PhD, a tropical tropical comparison where I went around the world looking at tropical forests in in Africa and Asia and New, in New Guinea. And then a series of studies done on the Pipeline Road, Sobrania National Park, the lim what we call the limbo plot, dealt with ecological biodiversity and a variety of contexts, seasonality and habitat selection by birds, demography and longevity, uh, the relationship between food abundance and bird populations, and then the study that we're going to talk about today, long-term population trends, Finally, I've also been involved with looking at patterns of extinction on Barrow, Colorado Island. My first summer in Panama was 1967. I lived on BCI and I found that the, the avifauna there uh, was obviously depauperate. That was something that had been long established. And that's when I decided I would work on the mainland in the forests adjacent uh, along what's now Silver Indian National Park also uh, done studies of migrant ecology. In that first summer on BCI, somebody had some mist nets. I had never seen a mist net before, but I put them up in the clearing and I got my first experience taking birds out of nets. And that convinced me of one of the best ways I could use to see the often very difficult to observe and track species in the undergrowth of forest. However, that tangled web has a major influence, that the net has a major influence on the kinds of bird that you catch. It mesh size determines what size birds get caught, the length of the nets, 
the net location, whether they're on the ground or up above the ground, the height of the nets, the bird size, bird behavior, all influence what you catch. So no matter what you do to try to sample birds, you're going to have some kind of bias. And my opinion was, and my experience now is, that that's a very good way to get a standard sampling uh, to standardize the information you're collected. The standard net we have used in that project since the, since the 1960s, 12 meters long, 2.6 meters high, 36 millimeters mesh, and they're placed with the bottom of the net at or near the ground. This is what it looks like when you walk up to a net. I'm sure many of you have done uh, netting and banding of birds uh, in this region. This is a red-crowned ant tanager, not a bird found at my forest site. It was at one of my other sites, and it was just an easy way to get a picture of a bird in the net. So the birds are at the center of this. The other thing that's at the center of this is the people, the group of people that over this now 55 years since my first time there um, ha have maintained a portion of the study that is, has now given us a 44 year uh, data set. So I, as a retired from University of Washington, was stated, I was leader of that project from 67 to 89, uh, during which I was at U Illinois and and uh, the Smithsonian and other places. I actually was on a graduate student at Illinois from 65 to 70 and a faculty member there from 75 to 1984. The next thing is a bird, a great Rufus Motmot. I happened to go the last time to my study site there in Panama in 2001 and worked with the teams that were doing some of the netting at that time. And as I was looking at the summaries of data that we caught the days that I was there, I found that this, a, a not this one, but a red, uh, great Rufus Motmot was caught in March of 2001. And I had first banded that Motmot at the same place in 1983. That's the oldest uh, that I know any bird has been uh, caught in that continuing study. I'm, I'm hoping we can do another analysis that from the larger data set. And if you see a number like that in a slide, that means an individual of that species has been caught in at 18 years after the first capture. Jeff Braun, one of my postdocs, then took the, over the project in 1989, and he's been running it since 2020. And one of his graduate students, a graduate student of his at the University of Illinois, Corey Tarwater, now a professor in Wyoming, took the project over a couple of years ago, and we hope she will be persistent uh, in maintaining this long data record. One other important contributor to this is a doctor named John Whitlaw, who lives, I believe, in Victoria, British Columbia. He's an amateur photographer, and he started going down there, and he was interested in photographing birds. And this is a book that's just published by Cornell University Press, Elusive Birds of Tropical Forest Understory. And it's a wonderful set of photos with some essays about each of the birds and some of the other aspects of bird biology there. I was asked to participate as an editor of this, but I just couldn't take on that duty in the recent years when that was happening. So I'm delighted to see they got a job done and they did it very, very well. This is the camp that we lived at during my time there. There was no place to stay with any buildings nearby. So we went out to this site. There was an old building there by a club that used to hunt uh, in this area. That's why it's called Limbo. The hunt club was named Limbo Hunt Club. Um, somebody went in and stole the roof and did a bunch of things like that. I went down there with Earthwatch teams, 15 to 18 people. We lived at this camp. Uh, you can see the poles here hanging, bleeding against the building that we used to put up nets. And just, we had evening roundtable discussions. People would ask me questions at various times while we were running nets. And I would say, that's a good thing for, the, for an evening discussion. And we had usually a couple hour evening discussion after we finished eating. Whenever a bird was brought into camp, we always had a round of people with cameras trying to get pictures of them. We kept them in the nets. We brought them sometimes out to the clearing. 
We always took them back and released them after banning them at the site where they were caught. We did not ban kingfishers or hummingbirds because their legs are not good for putting standard bird bands on. We also find other things. This is in, in the 1968-69 period. I don't remember exactly when. I was walking through the forest doing my bird survey and about 40 feet in front of me, I saw this snake stretched out going across the forest undergrowth. This is a Bushmaster, the largest snake in the rattlesnake family, the longest snake, longest poisonous snake in the new world. Uh, and there was a picture of a different one that I had to move off of our net line a few years later uh, on one of the other study plots. Here, uh, a uh, sloth that we found and sort of captured and played around with a little bit and got it back into the forest. I think it was crossing the road or something like that. There are a thousand birds known from Panama. There are 390 birds been sighted plus on the pipeline road in that area of the Parque Nacional Soberanía. The long 44 year data set recorded 252 species uh, and captured 149. So it's a very biodiverse place. The first years down there were very difficult because there were no books. There weren't, wasn't a really good book available until Bob Ridgely's book uh, published in 1976 was made available. That's available in a second edition. And then the more recent Birds of Panama by George Anger and Robert Dean. All of these are really excellent guides. The first study plot that I worked on is illustrated in black here. Later, I started working on additional four net lanes. One of my graduate students set up a larger study area in that same area to do studies of predation on artificial nests. And then later, another person came in who is now at Oregon State, Doug Morrison, and created a 104 hectare plot. Uh, and there's continuing studies there. And they've, in fact, now started to clone these 100 acre plots in several continents around the world. Key important information about the environment in Panama, dry season runs from January to mid-April. It often starts in late December. You see the decrease from November rainfall to December rainfall. So the rainfall, uh, dry season is beginning. It's very dry January, February, March. The onset of the rainy season may happen in April. Sometimes it doesn't really get started until May. But you see the pattern of several dry months and then a long wet season. The temperatures vary. It's hotter in the dry season and gets cooler in the wet season. As an example, here is one of the species that we catch. This is a golden crown spade bill. The oldest one of that that I have record of is 13 years from the first capture to the last capture. And that in fact is this bird here, that's the individual band number. Starting in 1977, I had authorization to put US Fish and Wildlife Service bands on birds and did that. Uh, that, hap that continued until I left the project in 89. And I think they've started using other non-US Fish and Wildlife Service bands since then. Just picking this bird, this bird, the second one, 14 captures starting in 76 and last in 89. There was a series of years here when it was caught in every sample time. Then there was big gaps here and there. And you see this kind of pattern. And so this is the kind of pattern we have for all the samples, two samples per year from 77 to 20. We have 85, almost 85,000 net hours, 14,900 captures of 149 species and 8,500 banded birds, except the kingfishers and hummingbirds are not banded. So I'm just gonna show a bunch of pictures uh, and talk a little bit about each of these, give you a feel for what the data set is like. So one of these is the golden crown spade bill that we just saw, 8.9 grams, three and a half inches. We caught, we caught, wait a minute. We had 522 captures of this species, including 254 marked individuals. So all of these were marked. That means there was uh, quite a number, over 200 uh, captures of, of birds, just as in that slide I just showed. This is an interesting bird. They fly upward when from a perch and 
hover beside a leaf and pick things off the underside of leaves. They're insectivores. Song wren, they flick leaves in the undergrowth of the forest and the leaf litter. They have very close knit clans of a couple adults and often as many as three young. Most tropical birds lay only a two egg clutch, occasional three leg egg clutch. These guys build bulky nests and many times they're put in the in shrubs that have ants that add protection to the birds. The ants don't seem to bother the birds, either the adults or the babies, but a snake comes in, a, a larger bird comes in, other things come in, mammals like predators, the ants will attack. Again, 500 end of captures, 307 individuals. Third one is a puff bird, white whiskered puff bird. It's in the family of puff birds and nun birds and nunlets. Uh, a larger bird than some of the others that we've seen. These guys feed largely on large insects, small frogs, and lizards in the forest understory. They're what we call sit and wait feeders. If you've ever been in, spent any time in tropical forests, you see a lot of birds that just sit there for a long time, just turning their head back and forth until something moves. One of the distinct things about this bird is that it has a very unpleasant odor. It's the only bird I've handled, and I've handled a lot of birds on in the tropics around the world. That's the only one that smells like this one does. This one also has dominant or prominent rectal bristles that such as flycatchers and swallows have. So the next graph or the next slide is three graphs. This is from 1970, whoops. This is from 1975 to 1977 to 2020. And this is the downward slope of captures of birds, this golden crown spade bill. It's a species that de decreased in abundance over that 40 years. The song wren showed no change and the white whiskered puffword showed an increase in population. So the thing we're gonna spend some time now looking at and thinking about is how many birds are decreasing, how many are not changing and how many are increasing. Let's just look at a couple of other examples. Red cap mannequin, probably the most common bird and certainly the most common thing captured in mist nets. Uh, this is a lack breeding species. The males get together and sing and dance and the females come in, choose a mate. Uh, they mate and the females go off and raise the kids. The males keep courting. Myrmornis torqueta, the wing banded ant bird was a bird that I discovered for the first time. It was found in the Panama Canal area in the like late 1960s. And you can see the time course of its population from a, an average of about three, three and a half individuals as the population in that study plot down to basically what's not different from zero or very close to zero. Brownish twist wing, another flycatcher, again showing a substantive decline in the number of captures over that time period from 77 to 2010. So now a little bit of explanation uh, of how we look at and think about these things. There's three key demographic or population trend concepts that I'm gonna use. The first one is the annualized proportional change. That's the rate of change in a population over a year. And we can make calculations of that in each year period over the, over the time period of the study. Out of the 149 species that we've captured in this study, the an annualized proportional change can be estimated with statistical reliability uh, and precision for 57 of those species. So we're going to go from 149 species caught in mist nets to 57. This is a graph that shows you the annualized proportional change. The vertical dashed line is zero. A species that has a population here is not changing. A species that is, has a, a, a distribution above that zero line is increasing. So we have two green species that pop, whose populations are increasing. We have 15 that there's not statistically different for the 15 of them in blue and 40, 40 out of the 57. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 
time. Okay, so the annual proportional tells us for this 44 year period that 40 out of 57 species are declining in abundance. It doesn't really have the best way to see uh, how much that decline is. So that, oh, I know. So one of the, there have been a number of studies done in a couple of other places with much shorter term databases in, in Latin America, uh, in Ecuador, in, uh, in Brazil and one other country, and each of them has had different kinds of conclusions. Our conclusions are that virtually every group of uh, food and location of feeding, every one of these groups is declining, although two of them are not declining enough to be st statistically significant. The trend is towards declining. The one that's declining the most are the understory omnivores, the things like trogons and motmots that feed on both fruits and lizards and, and uh, insects and so forth. The one that's most commonly viewed as declining in these kind of studies is the terrestrial, terrestrial insectivores, the things that are down on the ground feeding on insects. And our, ours are not unusually low as they are in a number of other studies. The second demographic or population trend idea that we, we work with is the total proportional change. If you take the annualized proportional change over the study for a species and you add that decline for each year over the 44 years of data, you then have an estimate on the size of the decline in the population, the proportion declining in that population. So this graph shows us that, and this is looking only at the 40 species that are declining. Five of them are declining by less than 50%. 21 of them are declining by between 50 and 75%. And and 14 of them are declining between 0.75 and 100 percent, between 75 and 100 percent. So there's a proportion, proportional change in abundance of the 40 species whose populations declined across the 44-year sampling period. To summarize that, 35 total species changed by more than 50 percent. 61% of the total number of species are declining by 50%. And this is a large, relatively undisturbed forest park, major population declines. Finally, we can also calculate how the number of individuals changes over that time period. And I just list that here. So red cap manic and the most abundant species had a mean popul predicted population value in 77 of 22.96, and that decreased by almost 14. Bicolored antbird number two decreased from 10.6 by 5.6, so a little bit more than 50%, and so on down through there. But note that this does not mean that it's the rare species or it's the abundant species. This is the abundance rank of these species in our data. And some of the most abundant ones are declining and some of the uh, least abundant ones are de declining. It's a spread across that range. If you just looked at these 10 species, that would mean the population for that set of species on the study site has, been, has declined by 51 individuals in the 44 years of the study. So this paper published in the Proceeding National Academy of Sciences uh, earlier this year. And if anybody's interested, I can probably provide copies if anybody would like to have a copy of it. So the first web that I was referring to in my tangled web analogy is the nets that we're using to capture the birds. The second web is the web that's created by the millions of years of ecological, evolutionary, and biogeographic processes that produce the regional biota. Wherever we are, now we're in Panama. And the best way I could think of to illustrate that was to use the 
profile diagrams of forest of foliage in a forest. On the left, very dense foliage going all the way up very high. Uh, in the second one, it's an old forest area, an area where the canopy has been opened up by a tree falling. And then the more extreme of that is where a very large tree came down and made a large opening in the undergrowth. So the web of trees growing, trees falling, uh, is the sort of illustration of how complex these systems are. What I'd like to do is now use a couple of bird examples to illustrate that complexity. This is a swarm of army ants. That's literally a basketball plus sized ball of ants that are held together by the ants at the outer edge of it, holding onto each other's legs. If you go in and touch this with a stick or something, it's like a, a, a landslide of ants falling out because they're no longer held in. There's a group of birds that are called professional ant followers. The ants go out from their bivouac, that was the bivouac, and they go out and spread through the undergrowth of the forest, even going up into the trees. They're looking for insects, spiders, centipedes, millipedes, any kind of arthropod that they capture or kill and take back to feed their kids in the bivouac. There are also a set of birds that go to these ant swarms and they're feeding on things that are lucky enough to escape from the ants. And these birds are professional ant followers. They make a living, meaning more than 60 to 90% of their food is obtained while they're following army ants. And the three birds that were illustrated there were the oscillated ant birds. They have a mean home range size of 175 hectares. They travel over very large areas. They don't have territories. They couldn't defend a territory large enough to always find a place where ants are. So they, they're very interactive. Uh, they're very aggressive at the swarm, but they are not trying to keep other members of their species out of a territory that they own. The, the bicolored ant bird is a smaller bird. They have a home range size of 44. And by the time you get to the spotted ant bird, they have have a home range size of three to five hectares, and they can't always count on having nest, uh, a bivouac or a, a feeding swarm. So they also are traveling out over areas. And like the others, they have a home range that they defend, but they will travel across other pairs territories while they're keeping up with an abundant food supply associated with the ants. All three of these are obligate ant followers. And one of the interesting things is that these Bicolored ant birds, and I may, so the others may have this too, have alarm calls that differ between whether they see a land-based predator like a snake or a coati mundi, or they see a hawk up in the tree. It's a different signal that they give to tell everybody that there's one of the bad guys around and you, they're telling them where that bad guy is, at least in a general sense. Two things here, you can see the ants that are shown here going over the branch where this bird is feeding. The ants don't bother the birds, but boy, do they bother you if you put your hand in there. And the other thing is that uh, I thought I had, I thought I had a bird with a band on it in this shot, I don't. So this is a spotted ant bird. In the early days when I was down there, uh, I would hold the bird in my hand like this so I would have a document of what kind of birds I was catching until I learned the birds. This is another diagram sort of showing the array of perching or feeding context. This one is going on the ground. We'll see pictures of them in a minute. There are others that perch on horizontal branches, and there are others that are specialized for standing on these small vertical saplings. And a couple of them are wood creepers. Uh, these are the three professional following, ant following wood creepers uh, that. Uh, the plain brown is the most common one. They're facultative animal, army ant followers, but yet they depend on, on the ants for 60 to 90% of the food. And an interesting thing that does to territories is territories are not defended by pairs. Females set up territories and males set up territories in the same areas, not necessarily with the same boundaries. And they're defending their female territory or their male territory. All three of these wood creepers, when they're feeding, 
they don't necessarily go up and down the trunk or the branches of the trees. They'll watch for insects or other things escaping and they'll fly down to the ground to catch them. There are three other wood creepers that do not follow army ants and they do most of their feeding on main trunks or big branches or in areas where they're probing into epiphytes and so forth. And just the, the difference in bills from this very large guy that's feeding in the canopy to this small uh, wedge-billed wood creeper that just probes in the little cracks in the, in the bark. This was one of my very delightful days uh, on my study plot 6869, when all of a sudden this guy popped up. I had no idea what it was, absolutely no idea. Uh, I didn't catch one that day, but I got a good set of notes and eventually figured out what it was. And the day I caught one, which is the last month of that 12 month study of, that I did in 68, 69, I finally caught him. Uh, and this is how I recorded it. During that year that I was down there, I kept finding a lot of birds that nobody had ever found there. And there was a guy, Gene Eisenman, the American Museum of Natural History. And he had produced a, a checklist or a little a diagnostic list of the birds of Panama. I tried to get a copy of it. He wouldn't give it to me. Uh, he was trying to keep it private. He didn't want it to be circulated. And I respected him for that. I didn't have a problem with that. About halfway through my time there, he sent me a, a note or called me or something and said he was going to be in Panama. He was originally from Panama. He was coming to visit family. And he wanted to know if I would take him out to my study plot. And I said, of course. And I had been writing to him monthly, telling him what stuff I was seeing. And most of the time, he would write back and say, no, I don't think you saw that. That should not be there. Well, the day that I, he went out with me for the morning, I showed him, I think, 10 species that he had said shouldn't be there that morning. I made a believer of him. And that he said I could have a copy of the guide. Uh, this is my nemesis bird, Rufus vented ground cuckoo. It's a professional ant follower. It's like a, a road runner. It's in the cuckoo family. And they're professional ant followers. But they're very wary, very agile. And they have managed to elude me for 55 years. Each time I go back, I hope it'll change. This is a tanager that's a specialized ant follower. They're tame, they often forage in pairs, and they're not very well known. I didn't mention that until very recently, nobody knew the nest of the, of the oscillated ant bird, the first big ant bird in the three species slide that I showed. So when I started working down there, there was a guy named Ed Willis who had been studying ant following birds for probably 25 years. And, and he never found an, a nest of that species. One time he saw a bird peering under a piece of loose bark. And that was the only hint that he ever had. The final bird in this story with the ants is a collared forest falcon. And they're not catching insects. They're grabbing birds that are feeding over the feeding swarms of ants. Uh, two other illustrations. This one shows the bivouac of the ants in a hollow log, a column of ants coming out, and then various of the birds scattered around in their relative, relative positions over the swarm. Finally, let's talk about the other things that are there. These are the ants. They're carrying probably an abdomen of a cockroach or something here that they take back to the, the, or the bivouac to feed the, the babies. Here is an ant that has been captured by a beetle, grabbing its leg and pulling it out away from the ants so that and it feeds on the ants. Here is the big uh, warrior ants. They have huge mandibles to fight things off. These are the regular ants. And this is a different kind of beetle walking in the swarm, living with the swarm, but hiding there. This is a fly that hovers over insects, comes down and lay eggs in the insect it's trying to escape. Commonly it's cockroaches. Here's a cockroach that had eggs laid on it. The eggs of the fly hatched, the larvae developed by eating the cockroach, and this is the, the uh, uh, perp 
pupa of this fly that has grown up after having uh, finally, this is a, a mite attached to the head of an ant. Oops. And this is the underside of that. You can see the legs. This is an incredible web of life. From 41 mites to 29 birds, including 8 to 10 ob obligate, obligate uh, birds, Beetles, springtails, millipedes, flies, wasps, butterflies, and bristletails have been documented living in association with these army ants. A total of 557 species associated. Probably about 300 of them are, if the opportunistic ones are excluded, about three of them as professionals. And each of these are found in different places, sometimes in the bivouac, sometimes in the migration column between bivouac moves, sometimes in the raiding column, sometimes in a refuse pile that the bat, the uh, ants have, or in the swarm raid itself. An incredibly complex web. And that's just the ones that for our interest right now, associated with eight or 10 species of birds. So how are we doing on time? Looks like we're okay. I don't hear anybody telling me to stop. Keep going. Okay, next, the, the next uh, little web of complexity uh, is a group called the uh, ant wrens. This bird is used to be called the checker-throated ant wren. Uh, they've changed it to checker-throated stipple throat, and they also changed the genus it was in. So there's no stability to names. Uh, and I find it very difficult because some, right now I have to try to figure out what bird it was that I used to watch all the time or see all the time that has a different name now. So there's a lot of work to keeping track of that. This is a particularly interesting species because they are one of the core species in, that forms mixed species, insect eating flocks in the middle levels and thicket levels of the forest. And this one is a specialist. It feeds on dead leaf clumps. There are many leaves in tropical forests. As they fall, they hang up someplace, and they often collect into a little group of them. And those are colonized by various kinds of insects, and especially spiders, hiding places for spiders. So this checker-throated ant wren or checker-throated stipple throat makes its living by feeding in these dead leaf clumps, peering into the dead leaf clumps. Probably the handsomest of these is the dot-winged ant wren, male above, female below. They glean from the leaves and twigs as they move through the forest, but they don't really spend any time, uh, appreciable time in the uh, dead leaf clumps that the stipple throat is in. Some of these flocks I've seen with as many as 20 or 30 species of birds moving in mass through the forest. And as they they move from one territory to another of a species. They'll just stop following, but the flock keeps going, picking up similar, uh, the same species as they cross another territory. The third is the white flanked ant wren, gleams from leaves and twigs, it's an insectivore. And uh, as we, I am not talking about the size or the number of individuals, just to illustrate that we have really substantial samples of banded birds over a pretty long period for many of these. And that's what allows us to make some good, strong, uh, robust evaluations of population trends. This is the fourth ant wren. It used to be called pygmy ant wren. It's now called the moustached ant wren. It lives higher in the forest. Uh, I've never seen it caught in a mist net. Uh, th th higher in the forest than the other ones, really up in the canopy. It sometimes descends a little bit lower when there's a tree fall and a thicket of vines and so forth at 20, 30 feet high. Royal flycatcher, many of you, I don't know how many of you have ever spent any time in Costa Rica or any other great places to go, Panama, uh, Peru, to look at tropical birds in the new world anyway. And uh, this one's called the Royal Flycatcher. Its name used to be Northern Royal Flycatcher. They flycatch insects or hover glean beside a leaf. They have a really strikingly hooked bill, big rectal bristles. 
They're often associated with small streams and they have a pencil nest that hangs, looks like a big, it looks like one of those leaf clumps of hanging leaves. And here you can see this is the nest. Oops. And this is what they do when you get them in your hand. They open the mouth, they've got that orange mouth lining. They then sort of crane their heads back and forth and uh, like a snake head. And I've never seen anybody that doesn't sort of get little goosebumps when they see that with this display of the feathers in the crown. It is true that they also use this as part of their courtship. This is a wonderful, interesting bird. Its, it's genus name is Sapayoa. It used to be called broad-billed mannequin because it looks superficially like a mannequin. And for some reason, I haven't got any pictures of mannequins in this talk. I can't believe that. Uh, but its scientific name is Sapioa enigma. It's an enigma because nobody knows what they're related to. Some people had them related to, to mannequins. Others had them related to flycatchers. But it just, none of it makes any sense. And the recent advances in the use of genetic information, we now know that this is the only Savasine passerine in the old, in the new world that has as its origin the classic old world Savasine passerine. Subossines in the new world are things like flycatchers and, and uh, ant birds and ferneriids, oven birds, and, and other things like that. The subossines in the old world are things like the broadbills, the Uralamidae. And it turns out somehow this bird got across Europe and Asia, came to North America, migrated down into South America, and it's a remnant population of one species in that area. I don't know how many other species they are, might be found eventually in the, the fossil record across Europe and in North America. Sapioa enigma, it's one of my favorite birds because it's such a puzzle. Ah, there's a mannequin. I do have a mannequin. Uh, uh, this was just to show uh, one of my Earthwatch volunteers for 10 years. I had, or eight years, I had Earthwatch teams going down there to help me with the banding. Uh, they paid for the, the trip. Uh, and supported us. They did the all the tasks that are involved in living in the forest for 10 days or for 14 days actually. And when we arrived, I would look at the faces of my volunteers that ranged from age 16 to in their 80s. And some of them were aghast. How could I possibly have said, I will come and live in this little building uh, it, with the bugs and everything. And I just asked him to give me 24 hours and if it isn't good after 24 hours, we'll take you back to the airport and you can go home. And we never had anybody that wanted to leave. Lovely experience with those volunteers and it helped me get a lot of work done over the years. The third, well, I didn't, my gosh, I went right through the, uh, the, the second tangled web was the ecological, evolutionary and biogeographic complexity that was involved in, in uh, the evolution of the flora and faunas in the places that was the trees. And I've given several examples of those complexities. Those complexities are what happened in the relative absence of human activity, not absence because even the early humans that went to this region had substantive effects on vegetation and other things. The third tangled web is the consequences of human actions from local land use to global effects of human actions. And the puzzle here is trying to get the tease out from the complexities of the natural evolutionary processes and what they've produced and what the effects of human activities of various kinds have had on altering uh, the biology of these birds and their associates in these forests. So just as an illustration, this is a map uh, that looked at the, the condition of the landscape in the watershed of the Panama Canal. You can see there's lots of forest in 1952. Canal was built in 19, finished in 1914. So even as late as 52, there were lots of forests. By 1985, this is what it looked like. 
So there's a big gap here between the forest, the remnants on the edge of the canal and the forest into the foothills and to the east. So uh, the, uh, a couple of other examples of the things that have influenced which species have disappeared. This is a golden collared mannequin. They're found in tree fall gaps or along the edges of the pipeline road. The disturbance in the construction and maintenance of the pipeline road for, for 60 or 70 years maintained a population of, of collared, gold collared man, mannequins along the road. Most of them have disappeared in the past 50 years because those things have been collared, plants have colonized them. They're no longer openings and second growthy. So this bird disappeared because of succession taking over and changing the nature of the corridor of the pipeline road. So what can we say up to now? Uh, let me just go through a few points. The populations of many of our resident tropical birds at Limbo are crashing. There are several ecological traits that are often used to explain what's causing that, but we're finding that body size, foraging guild, or local abundance are not a good predictor of which species are going extinct or whose populations are declining, to say it more correctly. Uh, and that is the surprising and in some sense depressing result of this work. We've observed the decline are alarming and they represent most drastic loss of intact neotropical forest birds in this site. How do we judge that? How do we generalize that? We need more studies that are collecting data over the long term. I mentioned a couple studies that have been done, one by a couple of my graduate students actually in Ecuador is now at 22 years. We need to do more to get more studies over longer term. We know that warming temperatures have an effect on birds. We know that uh, too much rainfall or too little rainfall has an effect on birds. And there are people now looking more uh, vigorously to see what kind of rainfall patterns or temperature patterns can be linked uh, to some of these changes in birds. There are indirect effects of climate change, not directly that the effects of temperature and rainfall, but the effects on food supply and abundance of predators we can now document that come as a result of human influence. Another one that's growing in importance uh, is the frequency of various kinds of diseases that attack or influence the populations of anything, which then have a cascading effect across populations of other things. The influence of these things on availability of nectar and fruits, because such a large proportion of the birds in these areas are dependent on either nectar or fruits uh, as dominant food supply. The local and regional habitat changes that I've mentioned the, the uh, change in the, the semi-open areas along the, the, the pipeline road and the changes in the connectivity to the foothill forest towards Eastern Panama, that fragmenting of the forest along the pipe or along the pipeline road areas adjacent to the canal. Uh, the take home, larger take home lesson is that we have documented uh, in the past 15 or 20 years in lots of places in Europe, and in North America and in Europe and Africa with migrants going between Europe and Africa, that there are lots of bird populations that are under major threat. And now we can add, at least with one study at one place, that this is also happening in tropical regions. And in this case, even in an area that has a fairly large, relatively undisturbed patch of forest, but its connectivity has been broken. So I have a bunch more pictures of birds. If anybody wants me to keep going for a few minutes, I will do that. If you'd like me to stop, we can stop and have a conversation. Go ahead, go ahead. We love birds. <laughs> okay, this is a russet ant shrike. Uh, most of the ant shrikes are black and, and, or at least a lot of them are black and down in the undergrowth. Sometimes the males are black and the females are brown. This is a, ant shrike that lives in the forest canopy in the vine tangles between seven and 15 meters in height and on up from that. They're rarely seen at the ground level. They have robust hook bills 
and they're one of the species that is most common in foothills and its population is not very good, although we don't catch them because they're up a little bit higher. They're not particularly abundant in the pipeline road area. We have one capture of one individual in 44 years. We also have dry season guests, and I didn't have time to find pictures of these to make a slide that has these pictures, but the dry season guests from the Pacific side of Panama, when the dry side of Panama on the Pacific, uh, adjacent to the Pacific, go through the more severe dry season, these kinds of Pacific slope birds tend to move into the wetter areas in the central area of the canal. And they do this along the pipeline road because historically there was an opening there that they could move down that opening of the road. I think this is happening less now than it used to because that open area is closing in as the forest takes over the, the pathway of the road. Uh, there's an, and this is gonna be a run of species that are more typical of foothills and they're not hanging on very well. Uh, some of these I will, also have a point in here that says new for the canal area. Uh, this is a hawk that hadn't been seen in, in the canal area uh, until I started working there. And there are many birds that fit into that class. An oil bird, crazy. There are oil birds on the pipeline road that have been seen. Many of you probably know the oil birds in Venezuela, in Trinidad. Uh, these guys roost in, uh, in uh, caves. They feed on things like oil palms. They're called oil birds because their bodies are so filled with oil. They were even used as fire starting, to, like as a candle, uh, because their oil content is very high. I saw one of these or two of these in 1968-69. Didn't know what it was. And they called it something else. But I now know it was too high in the forest and too big to be what I thought it was. And I'm convinced that it was oil birds. And also others have seen, a number of others have seen oil birds on the pipeline road. This is a woodpecker that I found, crimson bellied woodpecker, a lovely woodpecker. These guys do not live up in the canopy, in the canopy where the larger woodpeckers like this normally live. These guys are down on the ground in the undergrowth of the forest digging at fallen logs and things like that. New for the canal area. Olive back quail dove, new for the canal area. I, I first found that in the 1970s. The tawny faced quail, again, a bird not known in the canal area until I started working at this place. And I want to emphasize it, it was not my acuity as a birder. It was just that I spent lots and lots of hours there and increased my chances of, of seeing some of these unusual things. Tawny-faced quail. These guys go around as pairs. Uh, they're very tame. You can walk right up to them and they just sort of turn and walk away. Very unusual behavior. Wing-banded antbird, another one of the ground birds that was new for the canal area. Uh, they also feed on the ground. Uh, they're almost always in a pair, uh, like the quail, usually within four or five feet of each other as a pair. This was a bird that I found not on the limbo plot, but about two miles away. I, there was a stream there that I used to go up the stream when I needed a day of getting away from things. And I just parked where the bridge, uh, the bridge where the road crossed the stream. I go down into the stream valley and walk upstream. Uh, delightful way to see all kinds of interesting birds. One of the things you can see in this one called a dull mantled ant, mantled ant bird is like many ant birds, they have a white patch on their back. Lovely eyes. Uh, then they feed and nest along the stream there. One of my adventures on that walk, on one of those walks, was I walked upstream and when I came back downstream, I found jaguar tracks in my footprints from that morning. Lovely. Olive striped flycatcher, one of those birds that's commonly found at foothill forests and that, that were hanging on pretty well uh, in, uh, 
in the pipeline road area, but the cumulative loss over the 44 years is, I think, 99% for this bird. And this is uh, this is what I call the mouse of the of bird word bird world in the forest. It's a nightingale wren, now called scaly breasted wren, very much like our Pacific wren, very complex and interesting song that goes on for a very long period of time. And they're just little brown guys in the dark forest undergrowth, very difficult to see. And once you know the song, you can tell there's a lot of them around, sort of like the Pacific wren here. I uh, haven't said anything about migrants because we have results for the mag migrant component of this because we caught a number of migrant species. Uh, everybody will recognize this, uh, Kentucky warbler. And what I'm going to show you now is the graphs for the five species that we have enough data on to talk about how their populations have changed over the 44-year period. And you can see the slope here is going down, going down, going down. Uh, Kentucky warbler, Swain and thrush, wood thrush, or Acadian flycatcher, whoops, Acadian flycatcher and northern water thrush. There was about a dozen other migrants that we have caught. We're in the process of combining all the data for all of those migrant species and doing an ana graphical analysis like this of the trends across all, of, all the different species that we've been capturing. So I close with a white hawk one of my favorite birds there. They're specialists on finding and eating snakes, which made them heroes for my life. We didn't like it when we found snakes in the forest when we were down there. Uh, really lovely birds and quite fun to have an opportunity to see and absolutely delighting, delightful to be able to have handled one. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, Jim, this was such a rich, rich exposition of, of the study and, and so much else that's going on in that part of the world. Any of us who've had the opportunity to, to go birding in these areas really appreciated seeing all the, all the birds that you showed, the pictures, and not even having an opportunity to know what they were when you caught them. That's uh, those of us who come later are, are beneficiaries. Um, Elaine, I'm guessing that you are following what's going on in the chat to see if there's some questions. Yes, I have been doing that and um, maybe folks uh, have been uh, saving them and they want to say them out loud. And while you're thinking about that, Jim, may I ask you one? I mean, number <laughs> one or 20, thank goodness for these fantastic photographers who you very nicely attributed their work in each photo. That is. Um, this is just the, the best way of thanking them. Um, I did notice that your photographer, John Whitelaw, as in this white flanked ant wren that's on the screen right there, he, he seemed to have uniformly good light. Almost I wondered if they were posed in a cage or something. Do you, do you know anything about that? Yes, he, he actually worked with the teams at the, our site to catch, get a lot of these photos. And over the years that he's been doing that, he perfected a, a little system where he could put the bird in, the, in this cage with a branch that was appropriate for the kind of thing it would perch on and take pictures of them. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. And I, I, mean... I showed the picture of the cover of the book uh, that, that he stimulated as a oh. result of having those pictures. He wanted to see the pictures distributed. So the team uh, worked together to develop texts of descriptive information about each of the species that are photographed, uh -huh. as well as a few other things. Fantastic. It's, it's published that, by Cornell University Press about three months ago. Uh, it, it's just so remarkable. I mean, those of us who have had a little chance to go to this part of the world, we, we understand, I think, how variable the light conditions are and uh for for him to have gotten these fantastic photos i thought there must be something going on here because yeah <laughs> they almost yeah. Look too he, good. Would, he would work with the net the net lines when we would get a bird he didn't have a photograph of he would sort of hang on to that individual for a little while and get it set up 
Oh, remarkable. Well, really we, we, we thank the individual birds too. And oh my gosh, that 18 year, I've now forgotten what the species was, but Rufus isn't, Mott that, Mott. isn't that the most remarkable testimony to how the individual bird means so much uh, and how banding uh, safely done can really give us these moments of amazement. Yeah, we had I had many species that went as high as 15 or 16, but yeah. 18 uh -huh. was the record. And that guy was 18 since I first captured him, and he was an adult when I first kept him. We have a couple questions. Uh, two of them okay. have to do with nets, uh, Miss Nets. One is asking the height above the ground that you set your nets, and I think you said they were set at the ground, which was part of why you wanted to capture those, but maybe you can elaborate. And the other, um, actually, that that's the one Oh, another one came in. Is there an effect by which birds learn to avoid mist nets? And does this affect the capture data and thus population estimates? Great question. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, the first year that I worked there for a year, I did netting about every month over the course of that study. And I noticed within that analysis or within looking at those data that the number of birds captured declined over the year indicating that the birds were used to my presence and they were avoiding the nets. That's why I switched to a March sample and a July sample, late dry season and sort of a few months into the wet season. And we can't see, and this is discussed in the, in the paper that we published, uh, that when we have that kind of two samples per year, mm -hmm. there's really no evidence that there's uh, birds avoiding the net. Or that is birds avoiding the area where we're netting and they get used to being there without being encumbered by nets for periods of, of <clears throat> excuse me, three to eight or nine months. So that they don't, uh, it, there's no sign that there's a decline. There's some fancy graphs in the paper that shows how there's no, no serious decline in uh, capture rates as a result of birds avoiding nets. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have to do with food, I guess, in a way. Uh, this one I really like. Are there studies of the insect populations in this area, and do they show correlations with the bird declines? Uh, <laughs> good, good question, and I wish I had an answer. <laughs> the, I spent about three years uh, measuring plants and fruits and insects in several different ways in these forest sites, trying to figure out what kind of pattern there might be in the abundance of insects and the relationships to birds. And the problem is that you need to do that study at the level of what a bird eats and do it for each bird and what they eat. You can't take the average of all the insects and have, expect that to in any way relate to the dynamics that are causing changes in particular, mm -hmm. in particular birds. Uh, there's just so many bugs there uh, that that it's you know yeah uh, it, a, a bit you, can't, of a... you can't get a sample where you are doing what looking only at the bird only at the bugs that a particular bird is eating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one I, I, I thought is wonderful too. I mean, the, you mentioned and you showed that photo of the ants crawling across the feet of one of those ant birds. And here's a question from Jay. Why don't the ants attack the song wren young in the nest? And I'm sorry. And yet they attack snakes, which they cannot eat. Hmm. Is there something the ants are gaining from protecting the birds young? Hmm. Uh I don't know. <laughs> it just works that way. Uh huh. Uh huh. And and uh, you know, any all kinds of things can be moving around there. All kinds of of bugs and arthropods and mammals and so on and so forth. Uh, and the ants go after them, but for some reason they don't go after the birds. Uh, I guess if if the bird would fall down and be upside down flopping around, the ants would attack. But when they're just walking across their feet, the birds don't respond, so the ants aren't alarmed. Fascinating. Um, 
Karen has asked a question that is alluding to probably more of the migratory things, but I've typed the word, except I didn't hit return, MOTUS, M-O-T-U-S, and it should be a capital M, but the Canadian group that began the MOTUS uh, is one of these uh, radio tracking studies that are be done, being done globally. And Karen is asking if are any of your species involved in your studies also part of radio tracking studies. Yes. Uh, one of the things that's so impressive, when I started, we didn't have recordings of the songs. Uh, we didn't have a field guide. And now there are recordings, there are field guides, there are little radios that you can put on just about any of these things and track them. Uh, there's so much technology uh, that's available that it just opens so many windows that were not openable back in the day when I got started. Yeah. yeah. So yes, they're being their their radios are being used on birds there in central Panama now. If anyone else has any more questions uh, while I'm reading out Ed Newbold's, please feel free to either unmute and ask or type one in. Um, Ed's thanking you for your spectacular dedication over these years uh, and, and amassing a team of people that works so well together. Um, he's noting that it sounds like there are going to be waves of extinctions and question, have we seen extinctions in recent times in Central and South America? Uh, and, and Ed is mentioning the Spix macaw, but I think what I read recently is some exciting rejuvenation of that species. Am I right or wrong that they have recovered? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I don't know that one. I know that they were in big trouble. I know there are efforts being made to bring them back, uh, but I don't know about that particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I can tell you when... I first went to Panama in 1967. Uh, there were no macaws in central Panama. A hundred years before that, there were five species of macaws in central Panama. There still are no macaws reliably in central Panama. So that's one example of a major group of birds that's disappeared in the last century, century and a half. Uh, there are other things that have disappeared. Uh, we are getting a resurgence now of of harpy eagles and crested eagles in the area. We are still without a, uh, a crazy, uh, uh, what's the name of it? I've lost the name. Uh. <laughs> a? It's, a, it's, a, a, uh, it's in the falcon group. Uh, ex, uh, ah. Caracara. Oh. Uh, there, there's a caracara that specializes in eating bees and wasps. Really? And they were very vocal, very loud, very large. And they disappeared in central Panama. Ed Willis, who I knew there in the late 60s, he had records of them that he saw in central Panama. To the best of my knowledge, there aren't any of them now uh, in central Panama. When I first started going there, uh, I didn't. I didn't know of anybody that had ever seen guans. There's a huge not guan. Uh, uh, one of the things about getting older is you can't remember the names as fast. Well, we're used. all nodding our heads with Cur you. Yes. Uh, Curacao, great Curacao. Uh, one day I was walking down towards the study plot on a little trail. And a, a male and female curacao walked out into the ocean and came towards me. I would never have dreamed there'd be a curacao there because that place, the Limbo Hunt Club, was where people from the US military used to go and hunt game birds. Mm -hmm. So we just assumed that the curacaos were gone. Uh, but they're still now even seen them occasionally because the amount of hunting happening there is much reduced over what it used to be. So there's some resurgence like that, uh, but there's still the, the losses, the, the losses of the macaws. I don't know how many of you ever heard macaws flying over the forest and looked up to see them flying by. And it's just a tremendous sight. Uh, Usually so here. There, are, there are losses in the past century. Yeah. Well, I think that little pause in the action says, Everyone's smiling and thanking you in their own quiet way. Vicki? 
Yeah, uh, Dave, I think uh, I'll turn it over to you to conclude our meeting. Very good. Well, I, thank excuse you me, so just much. let me thank everybody for coming. Oh, thank you, you. You bet, Jim, is our pleasure. As it can, everyone can see, uh, a life of dedication to this is uh, certainly um, not just admirable, it's like impressive and it's so knowledgeable for the rest of us to benefit from your efforts. So thank you.